So we're reading from the sixth canto, chapter 15, text number seven. The chapter is entitled Narad and Angira instruct King Chitraketu. Dehena Dehino Rajan Dehena Dehino Rajan Deha Deho Abijayate Deha Deho Abijayate Bija Deva Yatha Bijam Bija Deva Yatha Bijam Dehi Artha Eva Sashvata Dehi Artha Eva Sashvata Dehena by the body Dehena of the father possessing a material body <coughs> Rajan O king Deha from the body of the mother. Deha another body. Abhijayate takes birth. Bijad from one seed. Eva indeed. Yatha just as. Bijam another seed. Dehi a person who has accepted a material body. Artha, the material elements. Eva, like. Shashvataha, eternal. So translation by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki As from one seed, another seed is generated, O King. So from one body, the body of the Father, through another body, the body of the mother, a third body is generated, the body of a son. As the elements of the material body are eternal, the living entity who appears through these material elements is also eternal. So everybody can please repeat. As from one seed, another seed is generated, O King. So from a one body, the body of the father, through another body, the body of the mother, a third body is generated, the body of a son. As the elements of the material body are eternal, the living entity who appears through these material elements is also eternal. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Sri Prabhupada Kiji. From Bhagavad Gita, we understand that there are two energies, namely the superior energy and the inferior energy. Inferior energy consists of the five gross and three subtle material elements. The living entity who represents the superior energy appears in different types of bodies through these elements by the manipulation or supervision of the material energy. Actually, both the material and spiritual energies, matter and spirit, exist eternally as potencies of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The potent entity is the Supreme Person. Since the spiritual energy, the living entity, who is part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, desires to enjoy this material world, the Lord gives him a chance to accept different types of material bodies and enjoy or suffer in different material conditions. Factually, the spiritual energy, the living entity, who desires to enjoy material things, is manipulated by the Supreme Lord. The so-called father and mother have nothing to do with the living entity. As a result of his own choice and karma, the living entity takes different bodies 
through the agency of so-called mothers and fathers. Om Gyan Ti Mirinda Sikyan Jala Salaam Chaksun Mitanera Tasmai Shri. So I'd like to seek the blessings of the devotees, the Vaishnavas present, so that I may be able to say something for the pleasure of Shri Sri Krishna Balaram, Shri Sri Radha Shyam Sandalita Vishaka, Shri Sri Gornita and Srila Prabhupada. I came to Vrindavan first time 30, over 30 years ago. And as soon as I entered the temple here and paid obeisances to Prabhupada, I felt as if I was at home. And every time since I've come, that feeling has always remained. And usually something happens to make that connection stronger. So I wanted to, perhaps during the course of the, like to give you a couple of my experiences, which, which shows the, uh, the, the, the incredible fortune that we have, which Srila Prabhupada has given us. He's built this house in which the whole world can live in it. And we, are, we can simply enjoy it. Of course, we want to also serve him, but he's done all the hard work. We're simply a little, maybe a little bit instrument in helping him continue this Krishna consciousness movement. Recently, uh, two weeks, just over two weeks ago, my spiritual master passed away in Braj and we were very fortunate that he was able to come to <clears throat> Vrindavan and it is uh, the duty of the disciples to appreciate the assistance given by especially Dharmatma Prabhu and Sharan Thakur Prabhu they're very humble souls, they won't want to hear this but we are indebted to you and also to Narahari Prabhu who uh, was very, very helpful in helping us through this very, very traumatic time. We had the glorification of uh, my spiritual master in this temple here, and that again deepened the connection with this temple, with the deities. And also we had the Antim Samskar um, at, at the Yamuna. So I'd like to thank the devotees, it's really amazing. So this verse, as from one seed, another seed is generated, O King. So from one body, the body of the father, through another body, the body of the mother, a third body is generated, the body of a son. That's quite easy to understand. Right? We've all come through that process ourselves. As the elements of the material body are eternal, the living entity who appears through these material elements is also eternal. That's perhaps a little bit harder to understand. Lord Krishna begins the instructions to Arjun by explaining the eternity of the living entity. Eternality of the living entity. He says, Natvevaham Jatunasam, Natvem Neme Jinadipan, Nachevana Bhavisham, Sarvevayam Ataparam. The, you have always existed as is all these kings and as I have and we will continue to exist so the very first instruction that Krishna gives to Arjun is you are eternal the living entities you see before you are all eternal and I am also eternal so in the next few verses Krishna emphasizes the point by giving examples so we can also understand that we are eternal, at least, at least have a theoretical understanding. Maybe we don't have the practical understanding yet, but we will. <clears throat> What's a little bit more harder to understand is material nature is also eternal. Krishna gives this hint in the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. He says, Deviyesha Gudamai. This material energy consisting of the three modes of material energy is divine, is my divine energy. So whatever's his has to be eternal. <clears throat> in the case of the material energy, sometimes it is manifest, sometimes it is not manifest. When Maha Vishnu, Karana Daksha Vishnu, breathes in, all the universes go back into his body. All the material elements go back into his body. 
So the material elements are part of the Mahatattva which enters his body. And when he breathes out again, the material elements come, uh, uh, become manifest again. But we must understand that the inferior energy as well as the superior energy, they're both eternal. The, uh, the material energy and the elements may not always be manifest. Just like the living entities who form part of this material world also disappear into the Mahatattva and are unmanifest for a certain time. But as soon as Mahavishnu breathes out again, the manifestation takes place. The Bhagavatam gives some very hard-hitting messages. And the pastime of Chitraketu, especially this aspect of it, is extremely instructive. And it may even seem a little bit callous, may seem very hard-hearted. A son is born to a king and he has died. And two sages, Angira and Narad Muni, appear before the king, who is distraught. He is in complete lamentation together with his queens. And the instruction given by the sages is, why are you worried? Why are you lamenting? Angira said, I told you, he came before. And he said, he granted a boon to Chitraketu. You will have a son who will be a cause of great jubilation and also great lamentation. But you weren't willing to hear about the lamentation. You just wanted to hear the good side. But you should understand this material body will come to an end. Our biggest problem, one of our biggest problems is attachment. And especially attachment to our offspring, our children. It's one of the biggest causes of why we will continue to be in this samsara, birth, death, old age and disease, because of that attachment. Bhagavatam very kindly gives us a pastime which can remove that attachment. It's not so easy to remove this attachment. Chitraketu had the great fortune of Angira Maharaj and Narad Muni instructing him. And then Narad Muni raised the sun. You will, we will see this later. And the living entity through the body of the sun gave incredible instructions to Chitraketu, which again put him back on the spiritual platform and Chitrake to attain the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I'd like to relay or um, share a pastime, which a uh, personal experience, which uh, we had about 10 months ago. I have um, two children, two sons, and one of them became married. His name, his karmi name is Anantashesh, and his devotee name is Krishna Prem. <laughs> So, he, he got married some two years ago. So, you know, the bond between mother and son, very, very strong. So, I keep advising my, my wife, my Dharampatni, don't be so attached to Krishna Prem anymore. Be attached to that Krishna Prem. Because he is now married. He has other responsibilities, other duties. Don't put any obligations on him. <laughs> anyway, you know what mothers are like. <laughs> Everybody has this experience. Right? They're very sweet. Matri Devo Bhava. Our Guru Maharaj always used to give that instruction. Mother is the first Guru. So anyway, 10 months ago, we came to Vrindavan. And first thing we did, came and sat in the Kirtan after Snan. And at that time, a devotee couple from Nepal uh, were also present. We knew them for a few months before that. Shishi Gonitai ki jai, Shishi Krishna Balaram ki jai, Shishi Radha Shyam Sundar ki jai. 
So this Nepalese couple came to me and gave me a big hug. And they said, we've got something for you. I said, okay, what have you got? We'll show you tomorrow. So in front of Shyam Sundar, Radha Shyam Sundar, they came and they presented us with a huge shalagram from Nepal that they had got themselves. Huge. I've never seen such a big shalagram. So at first I was taken aback. You want to give this to us? And I sought the uh, permission of my spiritual master before accepting the shalagram. And of course he said, you must accept. So we accepted the shalagram. We asked Mukunda Dat Prabhu the identity of the shalagram. And he gave us some ideas. Then we went to, he suggested we go to Padman Lochan Goswami in Radha Raman Mandi, who's one of the authorities on Shalagram. So Padman Lochan Goswami, he looked at the Shalagram, maybe for 10 minutes, and he identified the Shalagram as Anantashesh, which is the name of my son. <laughs> so this, we can see the reciprocation of the Lord. I was giving advice to my wife, please, don't be attached to your son, Anantashesh. Be attached to the Lord. And he came as Anantashesh, the Shalagram. <laughs> this is the mercy and kindness of uh, Radha Shamsundar. And actually, we're worshipping Shalagram as Radha Shamsundar. <laughs> when Mukundat first saw him, he said, this is Radha Shamsundar. So we decided that that is the right name to give. <laughs> so this attachment is very strong. We need help to actually become detached from such strong attachments. The help comes in the form of Bhagavatam, it comes in the form of devotees, it comes in the form of associating with the Supreme Lord through the chanting of the holy names. But that, this detachment from our material connections is fundamental if we want to progress in spiritual life. The part, this is the disappearance day today of Raghunandan Thakur. So his father was Mukundadas. He had incredible pedigree. His uncle was uh, Narahari Sarakar Thakur. Very elevated personalities. One time when Mukundas went to visit Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Jagannath Puri, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asked him, who is the son and who is the father? And Mukundas was so clever, he immediately understood. He said, you're right, Raghunandan Thakur is my father and I am his son, although it was the other way around. But Mukundas could understand that what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was referring to was who is guiding you in your spiritual life? Raghunandan Thakur was so advanced in his spiritual consciousness that he actually made his father more Krishna conscious. And his father said, yes, this, is, this son of mine actually is my father. He's making me do more Krishna consciousness. And we also see that in our temples. We often see, for example, we have a devotee called Kana here. He was very much instrumental in bringing his whole family to the Hare Krishna movement. Even though he was maybe two, three, but he used to, in the car, say, Hari Bol, Hari Bol, which means I want to go to the temple. And they had no choice but to come to the temple. And now they're in Vrindavan Dham. So we can see that. Sometimes the father actually is the son and the son is the father. Raghunandan Thakur, there's one pastime I wanted to share, which shows his uh, spiritual potency. His father, Mukundas, was a doctor and he was away. He used to serve the king, the Muslim ruler at that time. So he went away for some business for a day. And he instructed his son, I'm entrusting the deities to you. I would like you to cook and um, give them something to eat. So Raghunandan took that order very, very seriously. He cooked. He offered to the deity. He was a small child. The, deity, the, the 
food was still on the plate. So he approached the Lord. Have I made a mistake? Why haven't you eaten? Please eat. And he said it with such intensity. The Lord was forced to eat. He finished the whole plate. He didn't leave one morsel. <laughs> Good example. Even the Lord <laughs> finishes everything he has. If we take Prashad, make sure we don't leave anything on our plate. It's sinful to leave anything on our plate. Especially in Vrindavan Dham. So his father came back. He said, Raghunandan, my dear boy, where is the Prashad? Raghunandan was puzzled. What Prashad? Our deity has eaten it all. Raghunandan, was, uh, his father Mukund Prabhu was shocked. He's eaten it all. Didn't actually believe him. Okay, he said. Raghunandan, cook again. Cook something and offer it to the deity. He didn't disbelieve his son. His son was a great devotee. So Raghunanda cooked a ladu, offered it to the deity. The deity ate half the ladu. He'd just eaten a little while ago. He was full. So he, he ate half a ladu. And Mukund Prabhu saw it. And he was in complete ecstasy. Oh, my son, you are such a great devotee. You made the Lord eat. And um, I'm not sure exactly where this place is, Shrikan, but this deity is still there with half a ladu in his hand. <laughs> so I don't know if any devotee here has had darshan of this deity. So this was the, the greatness of Raghunandan. The other great personality today that we wanted to honor in our small way was Ramsi, Ramsi Das Babaji. And Again, his example comes from this point about detachment. Vamsi Das Babaji was very, very detached. However, we can't just be detached. That's no good. Many yogis are detached. It's not enough. You have to be attached to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, Vamsi Das Babaji was regarded to be a great sage. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakuma is the spiritual master of our own Srila Prabhupada honored him very much and he would ask his disciples go and serve Vamsidas Babaji. Vamsidas Babaji had although he was not attached to any possessions he had just a few little things Kopi and this and that. He had some deities so he had some things for his deities. He would never lock the room of his house. He entrusted the keys to his deities. So one time somebody stole the bowls of Gornitai. And Vamsi Das Babaji had such a relationship with his deities that he told them off. Why did you let this happen? You know I'm an old man. Why are you giving me difficulty? He was really giving, chastising his deity. That was the mood of service that he had. We can't do that. <laughs> but he did show by his example that the deity is a person. It's not a statue. This is not a marble statue. This is Gornithai, Krishna Balaram, Radha Shyam Sundar. When we chant the names of Krishna, we're not just chanting a name, we're actually associating with Krishna the person. If we do our chanting and our darshans in that mood, we will make spiritual advancement. If we don't, if we just think it as a name or a piece of stone or piece of marble, we will not make much advancement in our spiritual life. So Vamsi Das Babaji's example is very good that he was communicating with his, he was constantly talking to his deities, constantly talking. And in this particular situation, he was chastising his his deities. Why did you let this happen? I'm not going to feed you. He was so hard. I'm not going to feed you, he said. Anyway, so he didn't feed the deity. Nityananda felt hungry. So he got one man to bring his bowl back. <laughs> gave it to Vamsi. Vamsi put some prashad, a boga in the bowl and gave it to Nityananda. And he said to Chaitanya, you're not eating this. 
And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had a long face looking at Nityananda eating. So he decided also, okay, I'm going to get another man to bring <laughs> my bowl back. <laughs> so in that way, Wamsidas Thakur uh, Babaji had this incredible relationship. He's a very elevated person. Sometimes Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Maharaj Prabhupada used to say to his disciples, don't go and see him. It wasn't because that he was in Maya. But Prabhupada said it's because you won't understand his mood. That was his mood. He was such an elevated person. And in recent times, this is like in the 1930s and the 40s, so very recent times. He also had a son who was aged about eight, eight years old when um, he left his home and became a Babaji. So he was very fortunate in the sense that he was able to detach himself from family relationships, relations. Our mood when we're chanting the Mahamantra, which Srila Prabhupada has given us, is, My dear Lord, how can I serve you? Please engage me in your service. Often, when people come to the temple, they come for something. Give me something, my dear Lord. Because <clears throat> Krishna explains there's four types of devotees who approach me. One is who seeks wealth, one who is in material distress, one who is seeker of the truth, and one who is just inquisitive. Krishna doesn't condemn these persons, the one who seeks wealth. He says that they, they are actually udharan, they're very charitable. They've come to me. I'm so happy that you've, even though you want something, but you've come to me for it. You're very charitable. Thank you very much. Krishna is very obliged. Even though that devotee may want something. But our mood, which Srila Prabhupada has imbibed into us, is that, my dear Lord, you've given us everything we have. You've given us the air we breathe. That air also digests the food that we eat. You've given us that food that we eat. You've given us the earth where we live. You've given us such wonderful parents, such wonderful teachers. You've given us everything we need. So our mood, especially when we come to the temple, is what can I do for you? We can't do that much. Supreme Lord is Atmaram, self-satisfied. He doesn't need anything from us. But, just like a parent, <clears throat> if you if we give some, say, some sweets, some mitai to our children and they offer it back to us, how much pleasure we would get? Because you know that they're offering that sweet back to us out of love, right? We don't need it, but we accept it because they're giving it out of love. Similarly, the Lord doesn't need any offering from us. He's self-contained. He's happy in himself. So when we give something back to him, we try to give something back to him in our own little way, the Lord becomes so pleased. He becomes so pleased that he magnifies whatever we offer. Whatever we offer, he magnifies to such a degree. This is my devotee. Although we've hardly done anything, he will glorify us. Because the Lord is always looking for opportunities to glorify His devotee. So when we come to the temple, we don't have the mood, I want this, I want that, I want a new car, I want a new house, I want a new wife. We don't come with that mood. <laughs> Our mood is, my dear Lord, you've given us everything we want. Now please, what can I do for you? What can I give for you? Let me do some seva for you. I know you don't need anything from me, but let me do something for you now, please. And if we have an intensity of mood or service attitude, 
the Lord will always reciprocate. He's in our heart. He's listening to us. He's guiding us. He's our witness. He's always present. That's one of his compassionate kindness that he's always with us, looking after us. So if we have a mood service attitude, then he will give. If we have a mood, I've got too much service, too much seva. I don't want to do so much seva. You know what? The Lord will take the seva away. And that, that is really our misfortune. If we have a mood, constant move of, my dear Lord, let me do more for you. Let me be fully engaged in your service. Let me serve the Vaishnav. Let me serve the devotees. The secret to spiritual life. If we can serve the Vaishnavs, serve the devotees. I've seen that mood in this temple, especially in the last two weeks. Such a wonderful mood. What can I do for you? Once we serve the Vaishnavs and the Vaishnav becomes pleased, the Lord is duty bound, duty bound to, to help, to be with the person who's serving. He has no choice. The holy name has to come, has to come. Because if we please the Vaishnav, and the Vaishnav is always pleasing the Supreme Lord, we are Das no Das. We're servant of the servant. That way, that is the secret of success. Please the devotees. Always have a serving attitude. And that will guarantee spiritual life. Guarantee that there will be no fall down. Guarantee that we will make spiritual progress. Vaishnavs are very kind, very soft-hearted. Even we may make a mistake. Even we may commit offenses. But Vaishnavs are so kind. Even before you apologize, they've forgiven you. This is the nature of Vaishnavs. Even before, even you may not apologize, but they're forgiven already. No offense taken. And the example is of Ambarish Maharaj. Such an elevated personality. Durvasa Muni offended him, but he took no offense. On the contrary, he apologized to Durvasa Muni. I'm so sorry that Sudarshan Chakra was after you. And he, said, he prayed to Sudarshan, if I've done any bhakti in my life, please forgive Ambarish, even though he has done nothing wrong. See the kind-heartedness of the Vaishnava. And in Vrindavan Dham, any service we do is multiplied hundredfold. So worshipping, serving Vaishnavas, serving the deities, taking the holy name, taking prasad, all these things really enhance our spiritual consciousness. And the whole idea of ad advance, ad advancing our spiritual consciousness is to reduce our attachments. We have many, many attachments. There's the pastime which is quite a, a funny pastime, although whenever I say it, it never comes out very funny. Prahlad Nandan Maharaj always gives this story. It's, uh, I think Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj Prabhupada uh, told this story about the brahmachari who had a coping. And a, the coping was at, uh, always being eaten by the mouse. So he decided to get a cat so that the cat would chase away the mouse because the mouse was eating the coping, his underwear. Now, when you have a cat, you have to feed the cat. And what do you feed the cat? Milk. <laughs> so he had to get a cow in order to feed the cat milk, feed the milk to the cat so that the cat would chase away the mouse who was eating his coping. Now, when you have a Gomata, a Gomata is very uh, incredible. Unlike our mothers, our mothers will give us milk, but they will also, also expect, in my old age, you better look after me. <laughs> That's an expectation. But Gomata is so incredible. She'll give me milk and walk away. Walk away. No attachment at all. That's why Krishna loves her the most. She gives nothing expected in return. So, when you have Gomata, you need a dharampatni to look after the Gaumata. When you have a dharampatni, you need a house 
you need a mortgage, you need a loan to buy the house, to pay the loan, you need a, a job. So see how this brahmachari who was very satisfied in reading the scriptures, but to protect his coping, he ended up with a house, with a mortgage, with a cow, with a wife, with a cat, <laughs> attachment. That's an extreme example. But if we have attachments, if they're not spiritual attachments, they will bring us down. They will keep us in this material world until that attachment, until those desires are uh, destroyed within the heart. The only way to destroy those desires is by chanting the holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And by serving the devotees, by studying the scriptures, knowledge is very important. We are very fortunate to have the association of His Holiness Shivaram Maharaj. And he really supported us during the time of the Antim Samskar of our uh, spiritual master. So recently when we were in Mayapur, we again met him. And one question was put to him. Do we have to read? Do we have to have knowledge? And his answer was very emphatic. Yes, you have to have knowledge. Knowledge will give you the ability to become detached from this, from the crazy things that we are attached to in this material world. Knowledge will deepen your faith in the holy names of the Lord. Knowledge is very key because it will cut through the huge uh, amount of maya that's all around us. So knowledge is very important. Reading scripture is very, very important. Take a vow to at least read one chapter of Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam every single day because knowledge is key. Blind faith is not recommended. Even Srila Prabhupada says in Bhagavad Gita 434, blind faith is not acceptable. Yes, you, we will have questions. Ask the questions. Ask the questions from the advanced devotees. And those doubts that we have will eventually be eradicated. They will go away. But don't have doubts in your heart. Ask the questions. Always ask. Because just blindly accepting will not have the firm faith required. Because when difficult times come, then at that time, if you don't have the knowledge, you won't be able to sustain the Krishna consciousness. I just wanted to make one more point and then finish at that. Sometimes people say that if I can only relate to somebody according to how they relate to me. We have to be quite careful with that mood. So say somebody has been disrespectful to us or haven't honored us. How do we deal with that person? Right? So it's recommended that even there's some things we cannot control. We can't control how somebody else behaves towards us. We can't control that. But what we can control is how we behave. So if somebody is disrespectful to us, it doesn't mean we have to be disrespectful to them. Right? We can still control our behavior and we can control our emotions. If somebody is chari not charitable to us, it doesn't mean we don't be charitable to them. We still can be charitable. We can control whatever is within our control. This is what can make us selfless. At the moment, our mood is one of selfishness. What can you do for me? Right? It's, it's I am in the center. I and me. But if we change that around into what can I do for you? become selfless, actually all of our problems will disappear. In one of the purports in the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada says, if anybody has any problems, go and serve somebody who has problems. 
then your problems will be eliminated automatically. So this service attitude of selflessness is very, very, very important because it will make us less selfish than we are and more self-conscious. Shivarama and my spiritual master also always used to make the point, first become, have human consciousness, then you can become Krishna conscious. So first come on the platform of being a human being, then Krishna consciousness will be very natural. So Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. So I wanted to invite devotees, if you'd like to ask questions or make any comments, um, happy to uh, accept any, any comments or questions. Yes, Prabhu. Yes, Hare Krishna. Thank you. There's a category of who, who is choosing to do the service? Who is choosing to do a service? To do a service. Uh -huh. How is it to define that category? Okay. So, you're asking that sometimes the devotee says, I want to do this service, but not this service. Right. So, right. how is it to define that Right. Is that the right It can be. It, we have various natural talents. Everybody has some talents which through our past karmas, through the Lord's mercy, we have. So sometimes devotees may feel that, you know, I have this ability which I'd like to use in the service of the Lord. And it's really a skill of the management to be able to use the talents that the devotees possess in the service of the Lord. It's much easier. For example, if, if you ask a Brahman, to go and build a temple, go and collect, you know, 10 crores and build a temple. He'd think, hmm, how do I do that? But if you ask him to find a verse in the scriptures, he'd oh yeah, no problem. He'll find the verse very quickly, right? But similarly, if you ask a businessman, go and collect 10 crores and build a temple. If you ask him, I want to find this slok in the Bhagavatam, he'll be, how do I do that? <laughs> so each one of us has our tendency, our nature, and to the best of our ability, if we can use our natural abilities to serve the Lord in our natural capacity, it'll be a sweet way to serve the Lord. If, however, one is asked to do a service, and perhaps one may feel it's not the sort of service which I'm very comfortable doing, if one has the mood that this has actually, this request has come through this devotee, but it's come from the Supreme Personality of God as Sri Krishna Himself, then Sri Krishna will make it possible for you to do that service. The example is our own Prabhupada. If you get money, print books. <laughs> he only met his spiritual master a handful of times, right? on a few occasions. But every time, he received some instructions from his Guru there and he took those instructions to his heart. Sometimes we may get an instruction and we may not be able to fulfill it there and then. Fair enough. Some instructions are like that. My spiritual master has given me many instructions. One of them which you very kindly fulfill is to be able to give Pravachan as Vrindavan. I'd like to thank you for that. It may take some time before you fulfill you know, the order of the spiritual master or what the devotee would like you to do. But if you always carry the instruction in your heart, then the Lord will fulfill that desire. If the devotee has a mood, no, I can't do that, so I won't do that service. It's not the right attitude. It's not quite the right attitude. But also, the person who's asking should also be able to judge. If I ask this devotee to do, to do this, 
Will he be able to do it? Will he be able to cope? Am I testing this devotee? In that case, shall I let him know I'm testing you? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a two-way process. Uh, the ultimate thing is to have that mood of service. If we have that mood, that includes also the management, the person who's giving the service. Have that mood of service. I'm going to entrust this service to this devotee. Is he the right devotee to entrust it to? And shall I guide him? If I'm entrusting it to him, shall I guide him to do it? So, it's, there's no one answer to your question. But if you have the right mood, even a service may seem totally impossible to do, impossible to achieve. If you hold that service mood, your, that service order in your heart, the Lord, He can make anything happen. Thank you very much. Is that okay? Can we take one more question? Yes, Mataji there. Yes, possibly. Oh, you have to come a little bit forward, Mataji. Hare Krishna. I can't hear your question, but maybe somebody nearby can. Right. If somebody keeps breaking our trust again and again and again, should we continue to trust them? Yeah. At the end of the day, the Vaishnava is very, very forgiving. It doesn't mean we're foolish <laughs> and be taken advantage of. We're not weak. We're, we can be humble. We should be humble. We have to be humble. It doesn't mean we're weak. If somebody keeps breaking our trust, we approach the person in humility and say, Prabhu, Mataji, this happened. This happened before and again before. And I'm finding it a little difficult to understand. And more than likely, they will have an explanation that I did this because of this reason. And then you will be able to understand. Oh, okay. I can now understand. Don't judge anyone. We are not in a position to judge. Prabhupada, one devotee was complaining to Prabhupada about some circumstances. And Prabhupada instructed him, don't be quit, don't judge. Don't uh, criticize the instrument of your karma. Sometimes we are due some karma. Some reaction is due. Don't be angry at the person who's given us that, uh, that karmic reaction. We would do it. We would do it. Don't be angry at the person. Because that person, no matter who he is, he is a spirit soul. He is connected to Krishna as much as we are. He is son of God as much as we are son and daughter of God. So nobody can do anything to us. We've done so much against Krishna. Has he abandoned us? Lifetime after lifetime, we've rebelled against him. We've, we've done activities which, who knows? Krishna's overlooking all of it. He's, forget, he's always with us. So we follow in his footsteps. Not that we are Krishna, but we're trying to be Vaishnavas. We've always forgiving mood. We may not forget oh, this has happened. So I need to just make you aware, my dear Prabhu, that you know you broke my trust, but please explain, you know, if if I've got it wrong in in that way many misconceptions can be cleared. Is that okay? So there was just one more yeah. Hare Krishna. I am not sure whether I have taken the words of the Bhikkhu Vita. There was a mention of a seed produced a seed and a man and a seed produced a son. Should it have been a child or was it necessarily a son? And if yes, then what is the relevance of this? What is the question? The question is that there is a mention that a seed produces two seeds get together. 
Now, this is just an explanation of how uh, birth and death take place. As from one seed, another seed is generated. So, for example, so a giant would have been also alive. yeah, you're generating. How? What happens is when we eat grains, the father eats the grains. The grains actually converts into semen, which transfers into the mother, the womb of the mother. So that seed transfers into the mother, who is the the the, the uh, holder of the seed then, and then the child is produced. So I understand the production. <laughs> <laughs> My question was, uh, was some being taken a bit too literally by me? Like, should have been a child perhaps? Oh, you mean son or daughter? Yeah. No, it, uh, you're taking it too literally. Yeah. Bhagavatam will say son, but actually means child or daughter as well. Uh -huh. so, uh, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're taking it just too literally. <laughs> The essence of scripture is understanding who we are, who God is, what is our relationship with him. You don't have to get too nitty picky on the scriptures. Debates will always be there. Don't get involved with the debates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't waste your time on the debates. Yeah. Girl childs are Lakshmi. None other than Lakshmi. And without a girl child, where would you be? Where would you be? Where would you be? None of us would be here. So, uh, but don't get involved in the debates. Best thing is understand who you are, understand who God is, and what is your relationship with Him. That's fundamental. That's very key. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Shrimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Bhagavad Gita ki jai, Shri Shri Krishna Balaram ki jai. Shri Shri Radha Shyam Sundaralita Vishaka ki jai, Shri Shri Gonitha ki jai, Shri La Prabhupada ki jai, Gora Premanandi Hari Hari Bol.